All right. Tough loss. Feels like we've been saying that a lot lately. Uh, for the Knicks in Miami, 109 to 99. Um, this is tough. This is tough right now. Um, this season, as many have commented to me on um, recently, like it's been as much of a roller coaster as anything that I think a lot of us can remember. Um, it's, you know, it's been weird because I don't know that it's necessarily been ups and downs. It was just kind of very uneasy going for a while. And then there was such a high in January. And then the last two plus months have been a mix of uncertainty, have been a mix of worrying about whether they could keep their head above water. But more than anything, I think the last two months have uh, imbued a sense of pride in this team because of how hard they fight amidst um, really challenging circumstances. And it tonight was no exception, unsurprisingly. Uh, down 15 at the half, down 16 at one point in the game in the in the second half. Uh, I think they were down. I think they went down by 12. Uh, yeah, they did go down. No, actually, I think they went down by by 13 early in the fourth quarter. Um, <clears throat> and they just keep fighting back. Tied this one up with uh what was it like three or so minutes to go and yet i think the overarching sentiment because again we've been so proud the reason we've been so proud of them is because we recognize i think as fans how much that what they are doing is really i mean you talk about ice skating uphill and it's been two plus months of that and they have had opportunities to let go of the rope and they never have. And, and that's why I thought it was interesting. You know, what, what Breen said a few times tonight, you know, Clyde kind of alluded to it too. It was really Breen that brought it up that, and I think I wrote down exactly what he said at one point, New York's playing like the two losses took a little bit out of them. And I think it was obviously referring to the San Antonio loss and the Oklahoma city loss. And I think it was, yes, obviously. You lose two straight games like that, it takes a lot out of you. But I, to me, watching this game tonight, it was almost as if I was watching a team that, like, the last two months of holding on to that rope for dear life kind of took something out of them. And I think you saw that manifest itself in the first half, for sure, when they were, and really, mostly just the first quarter. Because if you look at the rest of the game, <clears throat> if you look at the rest of the game, they were Heat outscored them by three in the second. The Knicks outscored the Heat by five in the third, and they were even in the fourth. It was really just the fourth, it was, or the first quarter is how they came out. They were down by 12 after the first quarter. They lost the game by 10, you know? And that was enough. It's just they didn't, uh, different than how they came out against the Spurs. I think they didn't quite have the extra gear tonight. It was just something else. It was like they lacked that spark. They lacked that verb. They lacked that something else that we've seen them have now again for the better part of two months. Jalen Brunson, after having to shoulder an utterly gargantuan usage load to the point that he was just named Eastern Conference Player of the Month today, finally has a game where it's like, oh man, that was that was not great. And I really... I really hope everybody is responsible and mature enough not to uh, throw arrows at Brunson's way because God fucking knows this team would be nowhere without him. Um, you know, he had a rough game. Uh, it it happens. And, you know, you're allowed. Everybody's allowed. doesn't matter if you're a top five MVP candidate or not. You're allowed to have a bad game. And he had a bad game. And he picked a night to have a bad game. When um, it wasn't Jimmy Butler on the other side of the floor, but Terry Rozier decided to play like uh, he was in the MVP race with 34 points on it and 15 shots. And like, that's the other part of me. Why I like, you know, I was thinking, do I want to kind of go on a, a little soliloquy about how this team is really maybe they're, they're it's they're finally showing signs of a little bit of a mental wear and tear. Maybe Brunson is finally showing signs of a little bit of a mental wear and tear. 
Um, maybe. But then the other part of me is like, you know, um, Newsday reported before the game that, or during the game, actually, that Brunson, you know, mentioned he had a little bit of a cold. Right. And, of course, he was asked about it and said, hey, I'll be fine. I'm good enough to play. He's never going to use that as an excuse. And he won't use it as an excuse. But, like, maybe it was just Brunson had a cold and was under the weather. And maybe this was a matter of, like, a guy on the other side of the floor had 34 points on 15 shots and went 8 of 11 from deep. And because he went 8 of 11 from deep, they shot 44.7% from three, and the Knicks shot 35.3% from three. Like, sometimes it's really that simple. And maybe it is that simple. And maybe this isn't a game that we need to make. Or, or you know, again, we're not making too much of the game. That's kind of what I want to avoid tonight. But just, like, making more of where the Knicks are at at this point in the season than needs to be made. Um, I was looking back at last year, and last year's team didn't, didn't go up against anywhere near the amount of adversity that this year's team has gone up against. And yet with 10 games left in the season last year, this team lost three games in a row and it gave them six losses in seven games. Now from that point forward, they won, I think it was like four or five straight. And then, you know, they obviously wrapped up the, the five seed and, and onwards and upwards it was, but like, the fact that this team has now lost three games in a row, like it is not the end of the world. The sky is not falling. Whether it's whether it's because they were feeling the effects of what they've had to shoulder for two plus months, or whether it was just because, you know, um it was just one of those nights, like this team is still in a good position. Now, what's a good position? Your mileage may vary. Um, everybody was getting hopped up about the two seed a week ago, and now it's like, holy shit, are we sure we're going to stay out of the play-in? Like, that's that's what three straight losses in the Eastern Conference can can do. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to minimize the potential impact of a late season swoon. Like, they still need to win games here. I don't know if it's going to take three wins to stay out of the play in or the six seed. I don't know if it's going to take four wins. Could it possibly take five wins? Whatever it is, nothing about tonight, nothing about the thunder game and nothing about the Spurs game. Make me think that this team will not find a way to get the wins, the requisite wins necessary to, to secure a playoff berth. And if I had to bet on it, a, a top five playoff berth. And if you do that, like you're still okay. It's something that any of us would have signed for if you would have told us on January 27th, you're not going to see Julius Randle again until probably, or if you, you may not see Julius Randle again, but you're not going to see him again until at least sometime after April 2nd. And you're going to see OG Ananobi for three games, you know, in that time, we, we would have all signed for that. And I think if we're being reasonable, we should all still sign for that now, but it doesn't change the fact that, you know, we're feeling it. And it was another game that they could have possibly had, and they didn't get it. And it sucks, and it hurts, and it's annoying, and it's annoying to lose to that team. It's always annoying to lose to that team um, because this is not a great Heat team. Terry Rozier had a great night. They do a lot of good things. They frustrate the hell out of you, but this is not a great Heat team. And so I think that probably makes it even a little bit extra frustrating. Um, of course, as there is with every Nick game, um, win or lose a lot of positives. And I actually, I wonder, I wonder if we may, may look back on this game as <clears throat> not a turning point. It's a little bit too strong, but like, I wonder if we may look back on the positives that come out of, or that came out of this game as overshadowing the negative of the loss. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I think the Knicks may have found something with the bench. So unlike the previous two games where Jalen Brunson in a game they lost by, I forget if it was two or three points, he was a plus 20. And in a game they lost by one point, he was a plus 17. Tonight in a game they lost by 10 points, Jalen Brunson was a minus nine. And he played um, 36 minutes, which means in the 12 minutes that he did not play, the Knicks were about even. You know, they got scored by I got outscored by a point. 
And what was that attributed to? Perhaps not coincidentally, of those 12 minutes that Jalen Brunson did not play, Alec Burks also did not play any of those 12 minutes. He still, Alec Burks finished tonight with uh, what was a season low with the Knicks at least three minutes. Actually, what am I saying with the Knicks? Season low, period, because I guarantee he didn't play three minutes um, in any game with the Pistons. Might be the low mark of his career for all I know, but only played three minutes, and those three minutes came with Brunson. He actually checked in at the same time as Brunson in the first half. Um, just to give, I forget who he gave a breather, probably to give McBride a breather because McBride, I'm looking up, he played 45 minutes. So <clears throat> clearly the backup point guard Burks experiment is over in its place was a kind of a Frankenstein's monster of Dante DiVincenzo, Miles McBride, Josh Hart, and Boyan McDonavich kind of taking turns running the second unit show and it kind of worked and it kind of worked or at least worked better than anything we've seen recently. It gives you some shooting. It gives you some defense. It gives you some creativity. It gives you a little bit of everything. So, and in particular, I think what worked, what looked better than it has. And again, not, co not coincidental that all but three minutes of his tonight did not come with Alec Burks. Boy and Bogdanovich seemed to wake up. Uh, an even plus minus in, in 19 minutes. You like to see that 16 points on 10 shots. You really like to see that. I uh, thought he held his own on the defensive end of the floor. Not many times we could say that over the course of the time he's been with the Knicks. So if this is a game where we get out of this, hey, maybe the Knicks will not turn into a complete and total dumpster fire in the minutes to Jalen Brunson because Jalen Brunson is not going to have many, if any, five for 18 games again. We need to, he'll be better. If the bench could could stay at this level of productivity and Brunson gets back to doing what Brunson's been doing all year, well, then we're business. And so I think that's a potentially really big um, ram, I don't call it ramification, but like something that we could take that's a positive from this game. We'll see if it keeps up. A couple other big takeaways from this game, and I'm, I'm going to go in order of what I find to be uh, least interesting to most interesting. Um, first up, Dante DiVincenzo. Uh, the reason I say that that is the least interesting is because Dante DiVincenzo was an awesome all year. And there is quite little about Dante DiVincenzo scoring 31 points, including uh, on 21 shots, only went six of 15 from deep, which like doesn't sound great. And at the end of the day, the percentage is like, it's still, it's not bad. You know, it's, it's, it's not, or it's not, it's fine. It's, you know, it's a 40% night from deep. Um, it doesn't look great. Like when you look at it, but it's a 40% night from deep. Uh, and he needed to take those shots. If he makes a few more, you know, maybe we're talking about a different game. But I thought DiVincenzo uh, really stepped it up on a night that Brunson didn't have it. But again, that's not surprising because DiVincenzo has been awesome all year. But it was nice to see him, you know, again, have a big game when his co when his, his star didn't have what it took. Um, moving up the ladder of interesting pressure to Chua. So here are the minutes distribution tonight here at center for the Knicks. Isaiah Hardenstein, 18 minutes. Mitchell Robinson. 10 minutes and then pressure to chew played 27 minutes total but seven of those are was it was a backup power forward 20 minutes whereas the backup center so more minutes at the center position than isaiah hardenstein or mitchell robinson i thought that was uh essentially a, an admission well it was an admission of a couple of things um connected things from tibbs one um we need a center who is going to be able to switch because we're just we're most comfortable switching against this team. And I think, and he, he thought, I think clearly tonight, at least that the best path to success against this heat um, team, at least when the Knicks were on defense was through switching. And he felt that Achua could hold his own in terms of, you know, keeping him honest on the offensive glass. And by the way, I don't think that was necessarily a bad call. Precious Achua six rebounds tonight to Isaiah Hartenstein's one and Mitchell Robinson's one. One of those rebounds, of course, was the putback that um, tied the game at 92, which was really awesome. Did Precious get gotten by Terry Rozier on the one most important switch he had? Absolutely. Can't foul on that spot. He knows it. Everybody knows it. It was a rough play from him. But all in all, I liked the belief that Tibbs showed in Precious. Um, and the other admission is is that, uh, and again, this is kind of the, the related part, and it's maybe as obvious, that he thinks Precious is their best switch guy at the five. Is that something that may... Uh, we may see more of moving forward, depending on who the opponent is. Absolutely. I, 
it'll be it's something to monitor. Let's just say that something to monitor. So that was my second most interesting thing. And my most interesting thing, actually, you know, I forgot one. And I don't know, this goes somewhere at two or three or whatever. Um, Josh Hart and a, I think a heat uh, content creator commented on this. Played 46 minutes, took three shots. That hurt the Knicks. And, you know, looking to pass instead of looking to shoot, you can make the argument that he bypassed a lot of makeable shots to, to pass. Um, if I was a betting man, and again, I don't see the super chats or any of the comments before I, I start taking them from, from people, I would guess that he will be the um, punching bag tonight because he, people seem to love making Josh Hart the punching bag. It's um, it's funny, the guys that we we as a fan base choose to do that to. Um, I'll just like there, it, it's one thing to bypass threes. It's another thing to completely bypass shooting altogether. I wonder if that's if something was up with him tonight, if something was bothering him. I saw there was a, uh, a comment from someone in the KFS Substack who I, I think is was obviously was in the game in Miami that said he saw Josh Hart come out for shoot around and like took two shots and he was holding his elbow and then went to sit down. I don't know if there's something there. I'm happy to write it off as a as a one off for Josh Hart. Um, you know. We have short memories here, but this team, for as much as they would be nowhere without Jalen Brunson, they would be nowhere without Josh Hart. Um, and again, the, like the dude played 46 minutes tonight and they needed him to play those 46 minutes because like defensively, he is their best option against the C team. And I say that in full acknowledgement that Deuce McBride is also out there. But Josh Hart like that. Sometimes that extra size doesn't matter as much depending on who the most threatening offensive players are for the opposing team against this heat team that could throw Jimmy Butler at you that could throw obviously Terry Rogier at you um I think the extra size makes a big difference and I, I also don't think it was a coincidence that Jimmy Butler had himself a five for 12 uh night and finished without really making a big impact I think that's a testament to Josh Hart's defense I know he didn't guard him for every possession but he was on him a lot and um but Josh Hart needs to shoot it and Josh Hart knows he needs to shoot it and um, I'm sure that will not be a, a lingering problem moving forward. Um, and then the most interesting thing for me, and I'm going to end on a high note, and that's Deuce McBride. Uh, I mean, just go back and search my Twitter history about any number of things. I've had um, more shitty, incorrect, um, asinine, I mean, what any other negative word you want to use, takes, theories, thoughts, predictions, about this team and its players um, than anyone because I've made a lot of them and many of them are wrong. Uh, and I'm happy to sit here and admit that. And the thing that I'm of all of those very, very bad takes, the one that I'm happiest to admit to admit is that I never thought that Deuce of Pride was going to turn into anything more than a spunky eighth, ninth man you know, on the on the right team, maybe he's an eighth, ninth man. Come in, give the uh, give the opposing team hell for five or six minutes. Um, if you're lucky, maybe he makes an open three. Because <clears throat> that's, I just I didn't didn't see it on offense. I looked at the numbers. I looked at the efficiency through two years. Said, yeah, I know, not a big sample size, but it's it's enough for me. Guys don't turn into shooters overnight, not when they've shown this much over the over the course of two years. Not to say guys can't improve, but I just I wasn't buying it. For the guy that we witnessed on offense over the first two years of his career to turn into the guy who was I mean, I know DiVincenzo had 31 points on 21 shots. McBride, 24 points on 16 shots. Um you know, we're, we're arguing over semantics. He was, every, let's just say, every bit as good as DiVincenzo tonight in, as, as an offensive player. And not just as, oh, McBride's hitting open catch and shoot threes. He is graduating from that. He is doing different things. He's constantly moving. He's making himself into an offensive weapon. Is it in the way that you might traditionally see from a player of that size? Maybe not. But we're getting closer to that point. And he's just, he's made himself into an asset. 
Like, there's no like the Knicks are shorthanded and the Knicks are are fighting and scrapping and clawing and they're feeling it and they're feeling the loss of these guys that they don't have and it is it is making their life more difficult. All of these things are true, but I don't think for a second that the presence of Deuce Pride is hurting them. I think Deuce Pride is helping them. He's helping them as a starter. He's helping them as a guy who is playing essentially every minute of the basketball game. Um, <clears throat> it's wild. And I, again, didn't see it coming. Dead wrong. Couldn't have been more wrong. I was laughing at people that were like, yeah, I'm on Deuce Island, man. Shout out to you, uh, Alex. Uh, yeah. Uh, so awesome for him. And it's great for the Knicks because like, yeah, and I'm, you know, the injured guys, they're going to come up because, what you know, of course they're going to come up. But I, I he's earned the right to continue to play big minutes for the rest of the season. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. 